Okay, so let me um, uh, first continue with, um, with this uh, topic that I started yesterday. So we were looking at um, <clears throat> these accessible pathways. The uh, House of Cards landscape. So, situation where um, the all the fitness values are uh, assigned at random. So, um, for three loci, we have this little cube, and we put random numbers on the nodes. Um, and now we want to know, for example, if we start at all zeros, want to go to all ones, um, is there a path uh, to go between these two sites uh, such that the fitness is increasing along that side? Okay, so that was the question. <clears throat> and what I, what I showed you yesterday was that on average, so the expected number of, the, uh, of, of such path, which are... Um, accessible is equal to one. <clears throat> um, but I also told you that this is somehow misleading because typically, uh, in fact, there is no path because the distribution of this quantity and path is very broad. Um, and so I want to just give you an argument uh, that, that sort of explains this. Um, <clears throat> and for that, we want to modify the model a little bit. And we want to introduce something that is called the alpha House of Cards model, um, <clears throat> which simply, so what, what we need to look at is how uh, the accessibility depends on the initial fitness. It turns out that in this situation, the most important, um, uh, uh, the most important factor determining whether such a path exists or not is the initial fitness. And so we say, uh, so first of all, just to, to, to uh, simplify, uh, the notation, I'm going to assume that the fitness values are uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. Okay, so fitness values. It doesn't really matter, but for the argument, it's, it's helpful. Fitness values are uniformly distributed in the interval 0, 1. Uh, and strictly speaking, I'm, I'm going to, uh, the only place that has fitness one is the maximum. So the fitness uh, of the maximum has fitness one. Okay, so that's the sequence with all ones is equal to one. And, and the, the antipode is, uh, gets fitness alpha. Right, so the antipode, the sequence with all zeros, gets the fitness alpha. And alpha is a parameter between zero and one. Okay, so I'm going to, so if alpha is equal to zero, then this point has very low fitness, and as I increase alpha, uh, the fitness gets larger. <clears throat> um, and so now I can again calculate uh, the expected number of paths, or I can again calculate the probability that a given path is accessible. Now, um, <clears throat> uh, this path now consists of this fitness value alpha, right? So the first fitness, the first fitness that I have is alpha. Then I have some random numbers, f1 up to f uh, l minus one, and then I have the fitness one. Okay, so this is what the path looks like. So these are random and uniformly distributed. In zero and one. Um, so, what is the probability for this to be accessible? Well, um, so now I need um, I need uh, these um, l minus one random variables to be increasing, but I also need all of them to be bigger than alpha, right? If one of them is smaller than alpha, then the path is not accessible. Okay, so this is a probability that. Uh, F1 up to FL minus 1 are increasing 
and greater than alpha, now the probability uh, that they are increasing is, uh, as yesterday, 1 over L minus 1 factorial. And the probability that they are all greater than alpha uh, is 1 minus alpha to the power L, right? So the, the probability, or L minus 1. So the probability that one of them is greater than alpha is 1 minus alpha. The probability that they all are greater than 1 is 1 minus alpha to the L minus 1. Um, well, well, yes, but you see, um, uh, the, the, the argument is, I mean, you, 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 you have to pick these from a, um, you pick them from a smaller interval, right? So, so that's, uh, I, I think, um, yeah, so the question is how do you sort of introduce this conditioning, right? And I think one way of introducing this conditioning is to say I, I choose them all between, between 1 and 1 minus alpha, and then I impose on those random variables, I impose the fact that they are increasing, right? So I think this is, it's, it's essentially the same thing. Okay, so this is the probability. Uh, now, if we want to, want to see what is the expected value of, of, of the number of path, so this is again... Um, as, as yesterday, so they are L factorial path, and uh, this is the probability, right? So this is what we get. And so this is equal to L times 1 minus alpha to the L minus 1, okay? Um, so for example, if I put alpha equal to 0, if I, if I condition the first side to be of, of lowest possible fitness, then there will be L path instead of 1. So this will be much bigger. Um, okay, so now uh, what, what can we learn from this? So now let's, let's uh, think about what happens if we take uh, L to infinity. <clears throat> so when L is large, obviously this will, you know, for any, any finite alpha, uh, when L goes to infinity, this will be very small. Okay, so if alpha is small and L is large, alpha small and L large, then I can approximate this uh, by an exponential. So then I see that this is essentially something like uh, L times um, e to the minus uh, alpha L. And so um, <clears throat> uh, this will be, uh, you know, for any fixed alpha, this will go to zero. But now let's suppose I make the alpha smaller as the L gets bigger. So I can ask how, how big can alpha be for this to be of order one? And by just solving this equation, you see that this requires that alpha is approximately log L over L. Okay. <clears throat> so this tells you that um, if alpha is less than log L over L, then this, this becomes large. And if it's smaller than uh, L, log L over L, then it, it goes to zero. Okay. Um, and so this allows us uh, to begin with, to make uh, one important statement. Now, obviously, if so, so, what we really want to know is so the question that we really want to ask here now is what is the probability that there is at least one path? I mean, this is sort of what I explained yesterday that that uh, typically there is no path. So, so the the most important information is what is the probability uh, that we have at least one path? Um, <clears throat> and so if we, if we let's, let's say, let me call Pn the probability that there are n paths, which is the probability distribution of this, uh, of this quantity, probability there are n paths, then the quantity that we're interested in is, is, is 1 minus P0, right? So we want to know Uh, 
1 minus p0, so the probability that there is at least one path. So what is 1 minus p0? So 1 minus p0 is the sum of n from 1 up to L factorial, which is the largest number, times pn, right? <clears throat> and now this can be bounded. This is something called the Markov inequality. It's quite rather trivial. Obviously, this is, this is smaller than what you get if you put an n here, right? So this is smaller than uh, n times pn, but this is just the expected value, right? So the probability that there is at least one path is always bounded from above by the expected value. And now this, and this expected value we just calculated, and so we know that this is approximately um, L times e to the minus L, um, e to the minus alpha L. And so that tells us if alpha is less than log L over L, all right, so if I consider, say, a sequence of, of systems where, uh, which have an alpha depending on L, and if alpha is less than log L over L, then this will go to zero, and then this will also go to zero. All right, so then the probability of having at least one path will be zero. Okay, so essentially, what this tells us, and okay, the converse is much more difficult to prove, but it can also be shown, doesn't follow from this, this uh, inequality, that if alpha is smaller than log L over L, then this probability will go to one. Okay, so this is um, <clears throat> uh, 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 the, the statement. So, so, um, so more uh, detailed analysis shows and this is a, a mathematical paper by Hegarty and Martinson Um, that um, 1 minus p0 uh, essentially either tends to 0 if alpha is greater than log L over L um, and it tends to 1 if alpha is less than log L over L. Um, and so there's a kind of threshold here. And so essentially, you know, to go back to, to, to the discussion yesterday, if you now just put a, uh, put a random number here, right, if you put some random number here initially, then the probability that it will be smaller than log L over L is just log L over L. So, so essentially, if you look at the, 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 um, the system where all the, all the uh, uh, fitness values are random, then the probability that you will find one which actually has a path will be essentially log L over L, right? So, um, <clears throat> so if, um, if the initial fitness is random, then um, uh, the probability that there is at least one path will be approximately log L over L. And so it will go to zero and L goes, becomes large and this, and this basically means that, that almost all realizations don't have any path. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so what, what Hegarty and Martinson use is, is, is that there's something called the second moment bound. So actually, essentially what you need to do is to calculate uh, the second moment of this number of path. But this is more difficult because now you have to worry about, you know, then paths are not independent anymore. They could, they could join and go back, so they could sort of overlap. And this is actually a very elaborate calculation. So this is a you know, a paper in, in um, uh, the Annals of Applied Probability that is many pages long. So it's quite, quite a difficult problem. <clears throat> okay, um, so, so that's, um, that's a story about the accessible pathways in this House of Cards landscape. 
Um, so, so the next thing that I want to do is um, to, to discuss a class of models that are slightly more realistic. So the, the, the House of Cards model is, is um, not surprisingly, it's, it's too much uh, sign epistasis to be, to be realistic. Um, and let me, I have a feeling this is falling off, but maybe not. Um, So how much sign epistasis is there in this model? Um, uh, so let me let's suppose we pick two sites, right? So we pick, pick two two mutations, um, and 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 we look at their uh, at their relative, uh, you know, the, the single fitness effects and the and the double fitness effects, and then we saw already um, uh, a few days ago that there are basically there are sort of these uh, three basic patterns, so three pos possible patterns for um, two locus interactions. Pair interaction is uh, are these three motifs which I have been drawing a few times. All right, so this is always the the two single mutants and the double mutant, and uh, there is a situation where all the arrows are on on adjacent or opposite sides are parallel. There is no sign epistasis. Uh, we can have uh, single sign epistasis um, and we can have reciprocal sign epistasis, right? So these are the three basic patterns. And now for the House of Cards model, it's easy to show and it's actually in some sense also contained in, in the problem number three. Um, that these three situations, each of these three situations is equally likely. So that's not very surprising because in the House of Cards model everything is random, so the, the order of the fitness values is random and so on. So, uh, you know, the probability of having this is one third, probability of having this is one third, and the probability of having this is one third. So one third of all the sites will have reciprocal sign epistasis, one third will have um, a normal sign epistasis, okay? Now, um, if, you, if you remember, for example, the uh, data from Claudia Bank's experiment that I showed you yesterday, there wasn't that much sign in epistasis, right? There was this matrix with the two uh, lines of substitution, then there were a couple, but so you expect that in reality, um, uh, sign, ep sign epistasis uh, static interactions are, are rare, they are sort of sparse, and so we need a model that, that takes that into account, right? So in reality, um, Sign epistatic. They are there, but they are probably not that common. Actions are sparse. And, uh, and this kind of situation can be well described by Kaufman's NK model. So this is the next model I want to introduce. This model was introduced by Kaufman and Weinberger. Um, 30 years ago, I guess. 
Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's actually, you know, it's very directly in some sense, or, although Kaufman's motivation initially was to model the immune system, but, but, but in some sense it, it can be very well motivated by this picture, because basically what, what um, <clears throat> Kaufman is saying is that, uh, you know, under, under the House of Cards model, essentially all the loci interact with each other synapostatically, or most of them, and, and in, the, in the NK model, uh, you say each locus only has a couple of interaction partners with which it interacts strongly, right? And, and so what you do is you sort of subdivide, or you, you um, okay, you, you introduce um, <clears throat> a certain structure. So we introduce uh, so-called blocks or neighborhoods. I will call these blocks but often they are also called neighborhoods of interacting loci. Uh, and so I will call these BI. So each of these BI is a subset of the set of loci, right? So it's a subset of the numbers from 1 to L. Um, <clears throat> And I will assume that they all have the same size. This is not really necessary, but this is what Kaufman assumed. So the, the, the number of, of loci in each of these uh, um, subsets is equal to k. And this is the parameter that, that comes into the nk model. I should say the n in Kaufman's original definition stands for what we call L. So this is just the number of loci. Okay. Now this is a small k. If you, if you look into the literature, Kaufman uses a big K, and his big K is our, uh, uh, or our small K is, is big K plus one. Okay, so that's just to confuse people. Okay, um, so so all these sets are have, have the same size, right? <clears throat> and there are uh, there are uh, n b of those, so that the total number of blocks is n b. Um, so let me give you some examples. Um, so let's say I have, uh, uh, you know, um, nine loci. Okay, so I can I can um, I yeah, I can just div subdivide them into three pieces. So I say this is a block and this is a block, and this is a block, right? So this would correspond to three blocks. Um, so nb is equal to three, and k is equal to three. Now this is, um, what, you, what you can see here is, of, okay, I haven't actually told you how the fitness is constructed, but, but this is a situation where the blocks are non-overlapping, and it will turn out that this is a, uh, a version of the model that looks a bit trivial, but in fact is not that different from more non-trivial models. And this is called the block model. Or the block neighborhood. And this is also discussed further in problem five. I'll get back to that. Uh, but we can also do something more complicated. So let's again look at the, uh, this case of um, nine loci. And I can, I can say, let's instead choose uh, overlapping blocks. So let's say this is a block. Okay, but then the next block is this one. Okay. And then the next block is... Um, this one, and so on, and I go around the sequence, and I sort of close the sequence as a ring, into a ring, to, to, to make this, um, to, to um, you know, I, I connect the, so one block would be formed then by, by nine, one, two, and so on, okay? So I just take, take a window of size three, and I sort of move it over. So in this case, I would actually get nine blocks. Right, because in, there's one, for each locus, there's one block where it's sort of the leftmost entry, and k is also equal to 3. And this is called the adjacent neighborhood model. Uh, 
And this is um, <clears throat> the ver one version actually that Kaufman originally introduced. Um, and it's, it's actually the one version where most of the previous rigorous work has been done. But of course, I could also do something else. I could just choose the blocks at random, right? That would be uh, random. So we could just assign um, loci to, to blocks at random. And this also, so essentially in the, in the original version of work of Kaufman, uh, uh, they considered mostly the adjacent and the random model. Um, but here we will, so, so we will make one additional uh, assumption, which is that each locus belongs at least to one block. Okay, so if some locus doesn't belong to the block, it wouldn't influence the fitness. So um, we're going to assume that um, each locus belongs to at least one block. Okay, is, is that clear? Okay, so how do we now define the fitness in this model? So the idea is simply to say that these blocks are units which are interacting and there are no interactions. Um, uh, uh, so, so, well, that's, there are no, inter well, there are interactions between blocks, but only if they, if they contain the same locus. Okay, let me, let me show you how this works. Um, so we're going to write the fitness as a, as a sum over contributions from the blocks. So fitness is additive over blocked. So what does this mean? So I'm going to write the fitness. So this is now a fitness of our function, of our, our sequence tau. Or I guess I'm going to use sigma here, maybe. Yeah, let me use sigma. Um, So it's a sum over the blocks. And each entry is a fitness landscape defined on one block. And here for these fitness landscapes of the blocks, I'm again going to make my sort of maximally random assumption. So I'm going to say this is a house of cards landscape. So this is fi, so I put an hoc, so this is just a random variable. And what it depends on is the projection, and this is a a notation that um, my student Benjamin Schmiegel invented. Um, this is the projection of the sequence sigma onto the block. So what does this mean? So this you project down sigma onto the block. So this is the projection So you simply pick, so if you have your sequence here, so let me do an example. Okay, my sequence is some sequence of minus ones and, mi and ones. Right. And let's say this is a block. Right, this is my block. Uh, then I just pick the values in that block and I ignore everything else. Okay, so this would now be my sequence, the projected sequence, which is just minus one, one, one. Okay. Just take the loci in the block and, and take their values. 
Now this is, so this is a block of size three, so there are uh, two to the um, three possible configurations of that block. And so um, I need to assign fitness values to them, and I do that at random. So each of these uh, two to the k po uh, uh, configurations of a block gets a random fitness value assigned from some distribution. Okay, so this is what this fi house of cards means. Um, each of the um, two to the k configurations of the block configurations of the block um, are assigned <clears throat> iid random values from some distribution, which again, we don't really need to specify. <clears throat> okay, so to, to, um, uh, to construct um, uh, a landscape like this, I need two to the k independent random numbers for each block, and I need to do this for all the blocks. Of course, different blocks are independent as well. So for this, we generally need nb times two to the k random numbers. And, and in Kaufman's original definition, nb was always equal to l, so there were as many uh, blocks as there were, um, as there were loci. Um, <clears throat> and he also had the constraint that uh, every locus belonged to its, so to speak, assigned block, and then you would, you would have uh, L to the 2 to the K in Kaufman's original de definition. And you see that if, you, if, if K is fixed and L is large, then this is of course much smaller than the number of fitness values that you have in the house of cars model where you put everything at random. So this, obviously this model contains, in, in some sense has much lower, you know, much smaller degrees of freedom and the landscape obviously also has to be smoother, right? Because you, so, so, um, <clears throat> so what does this mean with regard to epistatic interactions? So in this setting, you can have epistatic interactions between blocks, uh, between two loci. Uh, first, if they belong to the same block, or if, uh, if they belong to, um, if they sort of are in the overlap of two blocks, right? Um, so, um, which means that, um, uh, yeah, which is actually more or less the same thing, right? Um, right, so, so for example, if I look at this picture here, if I, if I uh, mutate a block two, right, then um, if I mutate block two, uh, if I mutate locus two, then the contribution, fitness contribution that corresponds to the yellow block will change, but all the other fitness contributions will not change. Um, if, I, if I mutate block five, the blue contribution will change, but these two are uncorrelated, right? So, uh, so we'll have interactions between loci only if they belong to the same block. Okay. So, uh, and this, and in this way, we get, uh, we can get a rather sparse uh, network of interactions. So, um, loci interact sine epistatically. Actually. So here, there is sort of no magnitude epistasis. If two, if two blocks don't interact sine epistatically, then they don't interact at all uh, sine epistatically. If they belong to the same block.
<clears throat> right, so this locus four here, for example, would, would interact both with two and three and with five and six because it's contained in, in both of these blocks. Okay. The structure, so um, <clears throat> the, the fitness is a sum of contributions from the different blocks. Now, if I want to maximize this fitness, so I'm looking for a local maximum of this fitness function, which means that I want to pick a sequence such that changing any of the loci of the single loci will lower the fitness, okay? Um, and this, of course, then has to apply to all the contributions, okay? So if I look at one of the blocks, changing any locus within the block should, should uh, decrease fitness. Um, and now in the, in the block model here, the different groups are disjoint, okay? So if I, if I look at this block consisting of four, five, six, mutating four, mutating five, or mutating six should lower uh, the fitness of that contribution, but the other contributions will not be affected. So essentially, uh, each fitness maximum of the whole landscape also has to be a fitness maximum of uh, each of these blocks. Okay. And of course, now these blocks are house of cards landscapes, so typically they have many maxima. Um, and so in order to, 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 to uh, create a, a local maximum of the whole thing, I can just pick one maximum from each of the blocks and combine them. So, um, so if sigma is a local maximum, are local maxima of their sublandscapes. And, and they can be combined, uh, you know, they can be combined in arbitrary, uh, so which, which can be combined. Just pick one um, local maximum from the first sub-landscape, another one from the second, and so on. So it follows that the number of maxima, and this is, uh, again, uh, this problem five, so the, the total number of, of maxima is just the product of the, over the blocks. Um, <clears throat> of the um, number of maxima within each block. Okay. Is that clear? Okay, now these blocks are a house of cards landscape, so I can, so to calculate, and they are all independent, right? So all the blocks are independent. So to get the expected value of the um, number of maxima, we just have to take uh, the product of the expectation values of the, of the um, blocks. The blocks all have the same size, they are all independent. So this will just be the expected value of the uh, block to the power of the number of blocks, which in this case, or in the case of the uh, block model, the number of blocks is just L over K, right? And this is, uh, because it's a house of card model, we proved this yesterday, this is two to the K divided by K plus one. Okay, so the answer is um, two to the L, so you know, the, the L, the, the K cancels if I take this to the uh, to the um, uh, um, uh, L over K's power. So we can write this as um, two 
divided by k plus one to the power one over k to the power L. Okay. And so this is um, some number. You'll see that if k is equal to one, um, if k is equal to one, uh, then we here we simply have a two here. So then this cancel and this will become one. This of course has to be the case because if each block only contains a single locus, then things are actually independent. So then we have the additive landscape. But if k is greater than one, then this this number will be uh, greater than one as well. So we're actually going to write this now as two times lambda k. So lambda k is simply um, as can be read off here. So lambda k in this case is just this number that is written here. So this is k plus one to the power of one, one over k plus one. And this is some number that is generally um, uh, between zero and one, right? Um, and it's always smaller than one. Uh, let's see, now I'm, uh, so, you know, it goes to one, what do I actually want to say? Between one and two, right? That's what I just said, it's, uh, no, okay, well, one half, it's between one half and one. Um, right, this is the right uh, thing to say. And it's equal to one half uh, when, when, um, k is equal to one, right, then it's equal to one half. And it's always greater than one half when k is greater than one. So if we have, so k equal to one is the additive limit, right? So if each, if each uh, block is just a single locus, then we have the additive limit again. Okay. Um, and okay, so so uh, we can we can um, uh, discuss this again in the context of this uh, Fisher Wright debate that I mentioned, right? If you remember, there was this issue: Do high-dimensional fitness landscapes have many maxima or not? So what we see here is that uh, the number of fitness maxima, as long as lambda k, as long as lambda k is greater than one half. Um, this number will still grow exponentially in L, okay? So the number of, of maxima will still grow exponentially in L, um, but more slowly than for the house of cards model, right? House of cards model is lambda k equal to one, and this will be achieved when k becomes equal to L, so maybe I should say that as well. If we put k equal to L, which means that the whole thing is just one block, right? If k is equal to L, um, then, we simply get uh, here, so then lambda, lambda L is equal to um, L plus one to the power one minus L. This is not very instructive, but, but what you then see here is that two lambda L to the power L, of course, is equal to um, two over L plus one to the power one, one over L the power L, so this is equal to two to the L divided by L plus one. So this is of course what we had before. Um, so, so as long as, as K is greater than one, but less than L, um, the, the number of maxima will be increasing exponentially, but at a slower rate um, than for the completely random model. at a slower rate rate 
than for the house of cards model. Now this seems, first of all, for, to begin with, like something very, a very special result um, for the model, but in fact it's much more general. So if I, if I pick one of these other ways of choosing the blocks, less trivial ways where the blocks uh, overlap, um, then I get, but this is of course obviously much more difficult to show, uh, one can show that the expected number of maxima still behaves like this, so there's still some constant lambda k, which is between one half and one, such that the number of maxima is two to the lambda k over L. And in fact, the lambda k's don't differ a lot between different versions of the model. I mean, this was, when we discovered this, this was quite a, quite a surprise. So there's some, some amount of universality here, uh, which we don't completely understand, but um, there's uh, one of the papers in the reading material elaborates on that. Um, so let me just mention it here. Um, so for, well, let me call this nice. Uh, nice structures. I will give you an example of a non-nice structure in a moment. Uh, structure of blocks um, with overlaps, of course. Um, it is still true that um, expected number of maxima goes as 2 to the lambda k to the power L for large L and with, 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 with sort of similar uh, values of, of lambda k, especially for large k. And this is uh, elaborated on in this paper by, uh, with uh, Songmin Wang, Benjamin Schmiegelt, and Luca Ferretti um, that just appeared in a special issue on evolutionary dynamics of journal of statistical physics that I would like to advertise here, right? How many papers are there now that one can see? Huh? Twelve, okay, so yeah, so this is what sounds, uh, um, so this is Journal of Statistical Physics. 2018, and it's the paper is also in the reading material. So this is sort of this is sort of a complicated story. Actually, calculating these lambda k's for other structures is very involved, but there is a kind of picture of universality that emerges there. But but uh, I, here I just wanted to give you one example of a structure that doesn't doesn't have that property. So the nice structures um, here. Uh, what I mean by nice structures, we we call this uh, mathematically regular structures. Um, which means that, that all the loci are sort of equally, more or less equally connected to each other, right? Um, but, but you can, even within the, the, this uh, group class of models, where all the block sizes are the same, you can still create structures that are sort of more hierarchical, where certain loci affect lots of other loci, right? Where you have sort of hubs or master loci um, and, and others that are sort of enslaved. And let me show you, let me give you one example of that. Um,
an exception to this rule. Again, this is something that uh, Benjamin Schmiegelt uh, came up with, and, and we call it the star model. So here the idea is that there is a kind of master locus, or there are, in general, there are k master loci, or k minus one master loci. So let me just draw it for k equal to two. Um, so then there is one master locus. I give the number one, and then all the other loci are so-called gray loci. So I arrange them sort of around it. And then the rule is simply that the groups always consist of the master, one master locus and one gray locus, right? So this is what the blocks look like. So in general, we have, um, and this can be defined for any k. So we have um, k minus one master loci, or center loci, I guess we call them, and the rest, l minus k plus one gray loci. And for this model, so for this model, one can again ask how many local maxima are there, and, and this is essentially a combinatorial argument that you can also find in this paper. And what you find is that for L going to infinity, the number of maxima is actually constant. Uh, we have a finite number of maxima. Which is equal to two to the um, K Minus one, I guess, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and the reason is, of course, that these these ray loci are very are not very constrained. I mean, essentially, you can optimize all the ray loci individually, and then you don't have much much more um, uh, freedom. You have to think a little bit about, uh, you know, what the relations of the various random numbers are that you put in here. But it's it's actually not not so not that difficult to show. So this shows you that if you um, <clears throat> if you have an interaction structure that somehow is hierarchical, you can get landscapes that are much smoother. Right. Um, Smoother landscapes. <clears throat> yeah. Mm. We don't know much about that. I mean, uh, so one thing that is also of interest here, and, and you know, as I said, as soon as you go beyond um, beyond the, the, the first moment of the number of maxima, it becomes more difficult. Not for the block model. I mean, for the block model, you can calculate all the moments. It's actually also in the in the problem uh, set. But but as soon as you look at higher moments, then you need to worry about uh, how the maxima are being Organized, and in particular, an important question is whether, to what extent, they are clustered. So, how likely is it if you have one maximum to have another maximum close by? And uh, as far as I remember, for the block model, there is quite substantial clustering. So, they tend to somehow uh, be, be located closely together. But this is, I think, this is a question that needs to further investigation. I mean, how does the, you know, how the how the maxima are organized, and how does that also depend on the interaction structure? I mean, with regard to these accessible pathways that I um, discussed before, I, sh I, I don't really have time to go into that. But but what what we know, and this is again, you know, there's uh, this is really a kind of review, if you will. This is partly a lot, quite a, new, a lot of new uh, new results, but it's also a kind of review. 
And we also discussed this issue of, of uh, accessible pathways in the NK model. And there, for the block model, it's easy to show that the accessibility is very low. So, so this is actually a bit, um, you know, counterintuitive. So what I argued before is that uh, the, the House of Cards model has low accessibility because it's so random. Now here we, we reduce the randomness, but the accessibility actually becomes even lower. And in fact, there is a proof uh, or a sketch of a proof in this paper which shows that this is generally true for all the NK models, at least if L is large enough, that accessibility will always be very small. At sort of reasonable values of L, uh, this may not be true. Um, but, but this actually, so maybe I should, you know, since uh, I see some interested uh, faces here, maybe I should just say one word about how this proof works. So the idea is that, you know, if you remember this reciprocal sign epistasis motif, um, now this, is, this, is, this means that there is reciprocal sign epistasis between two loci, right? Now generally, of course, whether this is true or not for a given pair of loci will depend on all the other loci. So, so there will be, this will depend on the background. So a given set of loci will be sign epistatic on certain backgrounds and not on others. I mean, this is in the Claudia Bank data that I showed, this was sort of averaged over all backgrounds. But now the point is that in the NK model, when the system is large enough, you have a finite probability of finding something that is called globally reciprocal sign epistasis, which means that you have pairs of loci which have this motif on all backgrounds. And this means then that you can somehow never get past them, right? If you want to, if you want to mutate one, one site, then the other will always be, be deleterious. So this, this creates a kind of barrier in sequence space which you cannot cross. And, and so the, the proof is basically based on showing that the probability for this to occur is finite and actually tends to one if the system gets large enough. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I sort of uh, uh, refer to Daniel's repeated statement that all models are wrong, so why should this one be an exception, right? Um, yeah. Well, what it sort of shows you is that if you have this, these sparse interactions, right, if you have... Uh, well, one thing is, of course, that this is, again, a very global property. So you have this huge fitness landscape, and you want to get from one end to the other. This might not be a terribly relevant question biologically, right? Uh, the other thing is that it might be um, oversimplifying things to say that there are certain sets of loci that interact, and all the others don't interact at all, right? Maybe realistically you would say there is a little bit, you know, there's more like a continuous spectrum. It's, it's really all about the connectivity of the interaction graph. And if the interaction graph is very sparse, then you, you, know, you, you, you encounter these problems. But if you look also at the, at the simulations or the, the numerical data in this paper, um, you know, already for k equal to 4, I think you need to go to astronomically large L in order to see this effect. So it's a kind of, you know, it's a mathematical statement, but it's not necessarily that relevant for, for a real system. Yeah, that's actually very rather easy. So the point is, again, it's sort of similar to, to the calculation of the number of maxima, um, which is here. So essentially, the same is actually true for the number of paths. Okay, so, so, um, uh, so, so the, the point is, uh, if you think about it, so if you, if you have a, you know, if you have a, maybe we can, we can, um, uh, about it in terms of this example, right? So, so you have this uh, set of loci, and now um, you want to go from one end of the sequence space to the other, so you have to mutate each locus once, right? And now these loci are, uh, form these blocks, right? And so a given path essentially means that you mutate these loci in a certain order, right? So you might say, I start by mutating this one, and then I mutate this, and then I mutate this, and so on, right? 
So I go through this thing, and so, the, so you see that this path can be decomposed into pieces which are within a block, right? So, so the path starts out here, then it does a step or two steps in this block, then it continues here, and so on. But of course, <clears throat> uh, for the path to be accessible, also the subpath within the blocks have to be accessible, right? So, so the fitness values that you, that you encounter, uh, you know, so you have to go through the, 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 the low side within a block in an order that is also increasing in fitness. Uh, and, but there's a combinatorial factor, so there's an additional combinatorial factor here because you can sort of combine, so if you have a set of, of, of subpath in the blocks, you can combine them in many ways. So there's a factor which I don't remember, which is pretty large. Um, but then you have here, uh, you know, again, a product over blocks, right? Uh, well, fitness is additive, yes, but if you want fitness to increase, you see, you know, you have the sum, right? Now, as, you, as long as you move in one block, one fitness the fitness contribution of that block will keep increasing, and then you go into another block, and that also has to increase. So within each block, fitness also has to increase along the subpath, and therefore you have this multiplicative structure. And so this means that the probability um, to have at least one path globally is the probability of having at least one path in, in e each of the blocks to the power of the number of blocks. Right? And so as you, if you keep the size of the blocks f fixed and you take the number of blocks to infinity, this goes to zero. That's really the mechanism. So, so you're sort of limited. You have to have at least one path in each block, otherwise it won't work. And so that, that's what, what is sort of limiting you. Okay. Yeah. Well, of course, I mean, you know, I, I'm not really talking about any specific dynamics here, but of course I'm assuming uh, that I need to increase fitness, right? So these local maxima are traps because I cannot lower fitness. Now, this is, of course, even within the right Fisher model, this is not always the case. Uh, for example, at, at, very small muta at very small populations, you have a certain uh, probability of of decreasing fitness by fixing deleterious mutations. At very high pop population sizes, you can cross valleys. There's this problem of stochastic tunneling that Daniel discussed yesterday, which helps you to get across fitness values. So certainly the dynamics can help you to, to, um, you know, to, to, to lift these constraints. So these constraints are relevant in a certain regime where you cannot fix deleterious mutations and you're restricted to single. I mean, I will talk more, a little bit more about the dynamics tomorrow, but this is one specific regime. But the advantage of that regime is that you can, you know, you can discuss it without, I mean, you don't really explicitly need to talk about the dynamics. You can just look at, at, at fitness orderings in the landscape. Okay, so, so um, there is now one more, uh, so oh, there are sort of two more topics that I want to cover today and tomorrow. Um, as I said, in the end, I want to talk a little bit about dynamics, uh, but before getting there, um, I want to introduce, um, at least conceptually, another class of models, which, I mean, you know, it was already mentioned, the question, are these models biologically realistic? And they're probably not. So um, I want to sort of inject a little bit more biological structure into these models um, by considering, at least in a kind of toy model sense, considering um, a kind of intermediate phenotype, right? So, so far we have in these probabilistic models, we've just mapped the sequence onto fitness by some random, you know, some random description. Um, but there's no phenotype. And so what I want to do next is to 
um, talk a little bit about very simplified genotype genotype fitness maps. And I want to start from the question of how, you know, how should we actually imagine sign epistasis to come about? I mean, I've emphasized that there is sign epistasis, so the, the effect sign of a mutation can depend on its background. So how, do, how what is sort of a, what could be a mechanism um, could be a mechanism underlying sign epistasis. So let me give you a very simple example. Let's suppose we have some phenotype. Suppose some protein level in a cell, for example. And then we ask, how does the fitness depend on that? Type, then, you know, in many cases you expect there's some optimum. So producing more protein is good for a while, but if you produce too much, then fitness goes down. So you have a kind of phenotype fitness landscape that looks like this. Okay. Now you start your, so you, you have sort of moved this optimum, so, so the, the, the cell is not well adapted, so it has to adapt, and so you start say from, from this point here, so this is my wild type phenotype, and then you have some mutation that increases fitness, right? So you go from here to here. And then you maybe have another mutation that also increases fitness. Okay, this could be the blue mutation, which is even better. That takes you all the way, essentially, to the peak. So both of these mutations are beneficial in the, in the original background, but if you combine them, and this is, you know, for protein level, I think this is very plausible. If you have something that increases protein level and you have something else, then it's probably a good assumption to, to assume that the effects are additive. So now if you put both of them together, you overshoot the maximum, and the fitness actually goes down. Okay, so this is a very you know, robust scenario that would give you something like sign epistasis, okay? Um, but now, of course, in, you know, in general, there's not just a single phenotype, there could be more phenotypes, and if you introduce more phenotypes, things get more interesting. So you have more possibilities. No, 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 I'm just saying there are some, you know, this is sort of underlying this. So there's some, you know, there's some mutation that does this and another mutation that does this. I mean, I can represent these mutations as sort of, you know, in, in my sequence. I, I, this will become, you know, I, I think this will become clearer later. But, but essentially, I'm just saying there's some mutation that does this, another mutation that does this, and I look at the combination of the two. There's some, there's some genotype underlying this. I mean, this is a mutation at locus 1, and this is a mutation at locus 2, but this doesn't really matter at this point. Okay, so let's suppose there are two phenotypes. For example, for a protein, activity, and stability, or something else, okay? So now I have two axes. I probably want to write it. Let's 
one and x2. I'm again going to assume that there is an optimum and, you know, I'll choose my axis in such a way that the optimum is at zero. So here, this is where the fitness is largest, and then as I go away from, from this optimum, fitness decreases, right? So there's some sort of a peak. And so if I draw lines of constant fitness, they will look like this, okay? So these are lines of constant fitness. So now again, I can, I can look at pairs of mutations. Um, so suppose my current um, phenotype is here, and I look at two mutations that increase fitness. This is mutation one, this is mutation two. And I'm again assuming that the phenotypes are additive. This is sort of throughout this Discussion, this is the essential uh, assumption. Um, this is maybe, you know, you might say this is often not realistic, but it's sort of conceptually important because I don't want to put any epistasis in, right? So I assume there is no epistasis on the level of phenotypes, um, and so they are additive. And so this means if I, if I uh, combine the two mutations, I just have to add them up as vectors, right? So this would now be the, the double mutant. Maybe a bit, little bit further up, if I want to be accurate. Okay, in this case, of course, there's no sign epistasis. The double mutant is better than the single mutants, okay? But now I can do something else. I can look at, at another pair of mutations that have the same effect. So you notice also here, the two mutations actually have the same effect size, right? But if I want to get the same effect size, I could, for example, also go up here, right? So this is still a beneficial mutation, and it increases fitness, and I can again pick another one that does the same thing, right? But now if I combine them, I get a very bad effect, right? Then I'm somehow up here and fitness is very low. And this would actually be already reciprocal sign epistasis because each of the mutations becomes deleterious on the, on the um, background of the other. Okay, and so, so the, 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 the formal setting for describing um, this kind of uh, uh, behavior is Fisher's geometric model, which I will introduce more formally uh, uh, probably tomorrow. Um, but the idea is already here, so basically you, you assume there is a phenotypic space with phenotypic traits, and you have mutations are random displacements in this phenotypic space, and the crucial, crucial assumption which Fisher himself actually didn't make, which, which came much later, but which makes this a useful model for epistasis, is that these phenotypic displacements are additive. And then you can generate all kinds of complexity. I think today maybe I just want to show you a couple of slides, so maybe if we can start the projector. Um, So this is, um, a, a, you know, a more refined version of the picture that I just showed you. This is from the, the paper of, um, I should turn this on probably, right? Um, from the a paper of, uh, from the Tenaillon group, uh, 2014, uh, which shows these different scenarios. So there's no sign epistasis. Here we have simple sign epistasis. Here we have reciprocal sign epistasis. And what is sort of interesting here, I mean, this, you know, this you could say is still, is still sort of overshooting the optimum. But here, you, for example, you have a situation where there's actually no overshoot. You don't actually see the optimum, but you still have reciprocal sign epistasis simply because these fitness isoclines are, these lines of constant fitness are curved. And, and uh, uh, Tenayoan collaborators uh, call this uh, anti antagonistic pleiotropy, which we also heard about yesterday. Um, and so this general idea has been used 
um, in, in uh, a different uh, various contexts already. And so one example um, uh, that is a one-dimensional example. This is work from the group of uh, Holly Wickman. Um, so they worked with a bacteriophage, and they had a set of single mutations and double mutations, and they wanted to describe uh, the epistatic interactions. And so, so here, so what they did, so they only had measures of fitness. In this case, and this is true for both of these examples, they didn't actually know what the phenotype is. I mean, sometimes you have some idea what the phenotype could be. But here they just inferred the phenotype. That is, they assumed that each of the single mutations um, has some phenotypic effect that the double muta mutant, mutant effects are sums of the single mutant effects, and that there is some um, a phenotype fitness map, which they also inferred. So this is some gamma function with some parameters. But they basically ran all of this through their fitting program, and then they could sort of explain uh, the, the, the decline of fitness in the double mutants uh, by this function. So here you have the wild type, uh, these... Um, uh, diamonds are the single mutant mutant values, which all have sort of greater fitness. And then you see that at least from some of the double mutants decrease fitness again. Right. So this is sort of a way a way of of, of uh, rationalizing or parameterizing the amount of epistasis that you see. Um, and and we did something similar um, for for the system that I. Uh, explained to you yesterday this beta lactamase um, uh, landscape. So yesterday uh, we, we um, uh, discussed this experiment where we chose uh, two su two sets of four mutations each, one set with small effects, one set with large effects, and built the landscapes out of those. And so we try to um, parameterize this landscape again, using a two-dimensional phenotype. We first tried a one-dimensional phenotype. This didn't work, so we did, did a two-dimensional phenotype. Um, and in this case, one of the phenotypes was sort of calculated. So we calculated the stability of the protein uh, using some, some uh, uh, numerical code. And then we inferred the second phenotype, which we sort of speculated could be related to activity. Um, <clears throat> And then we, we also assumed a kind of function. So the function in this case, so these are sort of the, the, the lines of constant, uh, I guess, resistance is actually what we, what we measured here. So it's a function that actually doesn't have an optimum. It's just increasing along the diagonal. And then you try to, you know, you, you try to determine the, the parameters of the function and the individual effect such that you can describe all the, all the, uh, um, all the data. Um, and that worked reasonably well. I mean, I wouldn't say that this is a proof that it's, uh, this is the right description, but it sort of works. Um, and, and so if you look at this, so this is sort of an enlargement uh, and a transformation of this region. So here you see um, the, the, the small effect landscape and the large effect landscape uh, sort of located in this, um, uh, in this plane. Um, and uh, I think the uh, this is the fourfold mutant. Um, I think the squares are presumably the single mutants. There are four of them. These triangles are the double mutants, and these are the triple mutants. Um, and, and what you can sort of see here is that uh, you, you can get epistatic interactions, essentially. So, so the, the, um, these, uh, um, these mutants are sort of related to each other again by, by essentially um, vectorial addition of the phenotypes, uh, but you get epistasis because the lines of constant resistance are curved. Okay? So this is sort of, this is the idea. Um, and so what I want to uh, do tomorrow and in the beginning is to uh, discuss a little bit more how, how, you, can, how you, can, you can explain that or how you can describe uh, the properties of fitness landscapes uh, using Fisher's geometric model uh, maybe I can show you one more slide, uh, which we, we can get back to tomorrow. I think I hope this is the next slide. Yes. Yeah, so, so this is sort of this sort of um, explains the the basic idea. So this is again a two-dimensional phenotype, similar to what I had, or phenotype plane, similar to what I had on the blackboard. 
And this is now a case where we have three mutations. This is the, the, the wild type mutation. This is a wild type. There are three single mutations which are associated with these vectors. And then all the others are being constructed from that by addition. So what you actually see here is that what you get is a kind of projection of the hypercube into the plane, okay? which is actually, I mean, uh, an algebraic geometer told me that this has some important, you know, this is something that algebraic geometrists do all the time. This has some name, which I've forgotten. But this is what you do. And then you see, and, and so here are the lines of constant. This is the, the optimum. This is where my wild type is sitting. And so you see that this way you generate multiple maxima, for example. So, for example, this uh, uh, genotype here or this uh, has, a, has an optimal uh, phenotype because all of the neighbors have lower fitness, right? So you generate in this way landscapes that are rugged in the sense that I explained to you uh, in, in previous lectures. And we're going to look at the... This is, again, mathematically rather involved, but I will, I will give you some results and show you a little bit more detail how this works. And maybe also say, you know, give you a more uh, historical view of, of um, Fisher's geometric model. There's a paper on, on a kind of review paper on Fisher's geometric model by Olivier Tenaillon, which is also in the reading material, uh, which is a very nice introduction. Okay, but I think this is a good, good time to stop, so we'll continue with this tomorrow. Thanks. And we can take more questions, of course. <laughs> back, back to your uh, NK uh, uh -huh. uh, fitness landscape. It's very reminiscent of uh, these low density parity check codes where your local maxima are the allowed code words. And in, in the case of low density parity check codes, it's known that the number of code words is exponential in the total length of the string, uh, which is again reminiscent of your exponential growth, but also that there is a way to efficiently calculate the closest code word from where you are, which is a few mutations away, through belief through a belief propagation type of yes, framework. Yes. So, so um, you know, somehow there is a local search strategy which okay, which okay, might be viable. So, yeah, I'm sort of aware of this this connection, uh, uh, and and you know, initially when we when we saw how things uh, depended on k here, we also tried to connect this to some some things that are known about the KSAT problem and so on. But I haven't really pursued that, but that's a good, very good uh, suggestion. Thank you. Where everything, the statistics just depend on the hemming between the, the fitness difference between two genomes just depends on the hemming. And it sort of subsumes <coughs> a lot of these, uh, these ones, but they tend to be the special cases of uh, that. And we'll come up quite a lot of things out for, uh, uh, for that as well. And it's, um, you know, it depends on how you, you take limits. If you sort of start off saying, okay, the large genome limit with a finite number of changes away from the current genome, it's limited by the ones. Then the sort of number of you know, sort of reasonable things, the past reason things that goes down, and a lot of the models then um, uh, simplify in that. But, the, but, but this, I mean, this is not necessarily true. I mean, you say that the, the fitness difference between two sequences depends only on their Hamming distance? Or if I say the statistical property. The statistical property. Okay, statistical so you have, a kind of, you have a kind of kernel which generates for you right. the statistics as a function of distance. But do you think if this I want to make If I want to make okay. something which is, doesn't depend on the current, um, uh, the current genome, mm -hmm. except I can let it evolve for a while, then we'll be able to Right. So do you have some references on that, or it's again? <laughs> okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay, thank you.